OK. Let's start. As I was saying you, thank you so much for being here. This, this session is called Open Data, Open House. We are doing it in different time zones just to cover different regions. Uh, last week, we have the, the LATAM session. That was the first one. Now we are doing this session that covers uh, some projects from Europe and Africa. And next week, we are going to have a session for Asia and Oceania, and the last week of the month, a session for North America. Then I'm going to share with you the rest of the of the dates in case you want to join some of them. We, we are here uh, to share uh, some open data principles and policies and we want to know from our network and from from our organizations and governments that work in this region what's new what you what what you're working on with open data what are the projects that you are thinking on uh, what have you done and what are you planning to do in 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 the in the future and in the near future and we want to share a uh, related knowledge on the topic and resources that may be helpful for the community, just two uh, two two small advices. Um, you can. We are going to have four presentations, and we're going to have a, a time slot in the end for questions and reflections. But the participants can leave the questions also. If if you don't want to do the question. Uh, loud you can leave the question in the chat and it's okay i can take it and uh, if we have enough time in the end and there's some other participant that is not included in the in the speakers we have in the agenda that wants to present another project uh, we can have an open moment to do that i'm going to share my screen just for a very very quick presentation one minute I hope you all can see it. Well, this is the agenda for the session, for today's session. Um, we're going to have a presentation. Uh, it's going to be done by Ponselet Ileleji from Jogo Labs Banchu. Then we're going to hear to Carl Donard from Eurogeo. Then we're going to hear some projects from Roberto Magro Pedro Viejo from the Network of Local Entities for Participation and Transparency uh, of the FEM, more, more, more directly the Open Data Working Group. And then we are going to hear to Charlie Marshall from Afro Leadership. And then we're going to have a, a, a free space in the end to share uh, questions and uh, if you have time, maybe some other project. Just a quick introduction on our work. The Open, the Open Data Charter is a collaboration between more than 170 government and experts working to open up data around the world. It was founded in 2015, and we have grown uh, a lot since that moment. And nowadays, we are working in some core thematic axis and agenda, mainly in climate change, gender, and anti-corruption. And more recently, we have developed a research area when we are where we are working on uh, digital rights, mainly trying to understand the balance between open data and the right to privacy, and um, artificial intelligence, trying to understand the, the data needs that some artificial intelligence projects have nowadays. You all, you all, I, I, I guess you are all fam familiarized with what open data is. But just a, a quick reminder: uh, open data and content come. It's the data that can be freely used, modified, sh and shared by anyone for any purpose. Uh, we have six global principles in the charter that I'm going to share really, really quickly, so that we don't that I don't steal more time from the speakers. We said that the data should be open by default, and also nowadays we say that it should be open with a with a concrete uh, purpose. When we say by default, we know that there are some data that can't be open, and because of the right to privacy, and so we have to 
to look at each case in particular and see how, how, how can we achieve that balance. We say that data has to be open, timely, and comprehensive. It's like it has to be updated with a good frequency. Sometimes when we, if, 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 if a journalist or civil society organization needs the data and the data we are opening is too old, it, it's, it's not going to be useful and it's not going to be really, uh, not, it's not going to have a, go, a good impact. Uh, we say the data has to be accessible and usable. It has to be uh, free, easy to access, and usable and machine readable. It has to be comparable and interoperable. And we say also it has to be for improved governance and citizen engagement. Improved governance, it means that there's a whole part of the of the open government and open data that is not seen outside of the government. That is how all the principle, all the all the processes inside the government uh, improves because you have to plan the opening, you have to find standards, different different areas and different government agencies start to communicate better and to share information inside, so the processes get better and the public services get better. Uh, for citizen engagement, because it's just it's not only for accountability and control, also when we open data, uh, universities and organizations can work on, on different projects and give feedback to the government and work together in, in improving the public policies. Uh, we said for inclusive development and innovation, mainly it, it is a little bit related with the core topics that I told you that we are uh, working on these days. It's like open data, it's useful to address some of the most uh, important challenges that we have nowadays in, in this century. I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen and just present our first speaker. Just one minute. Okay. Our first speaker today is Ponselet Ilelechi from Chocolabs Van Schul. He's going to present a Taproot Earth project. I'm going to present a small view of Ponselet. He's a computer scientist by profession with over 25 years in the field. He has been involved with the use of information and technology communication as a tool for sustainable development, development both as the lead and CEO of Chocolabs. Uh, Banjul in the Gambia and on the board of, Cho of Chocolabs Global Network. Chocolabs is an independent non-profit organization that serves as an open innovation ecosystem and a virtual cluster for social transformation based on an organic community of entrepreneurs and a network of innovation centers. So, Ponselet, uh, the screen is yours. You can start your presentation. Thank you very much, um, Renato. Um, I, I think um, I'm happy to be here for this presentation and greetings presently um, talking from Sudan, South Sudan, Juba, because I'm here to help the UNDP to set up a project on innovation at the University of Juba, you know, so I'm speaking from South Sudan. Uh, my presentation today focuses on Jopolab's work we have been doing for the last um, two years. Um, we, have, we, we have been involved in climatic change and um, we have been working with a partner, um, one of our partners in the United States in, in, this, in the south of the US, taproot.x. And um, this year, we, because of what has been happening with climatic change, we have decided to focus on how climatic change has affected our women farmers that carry out um, rice cultivation because we have been, um, these women farmers have really 
been affected by so, so, um, intrusion of salt water into the River Gambia. And in doing this, we had to look for very ways, apart from checking the salinity level, um, the most important thing was collecting the data. Um, and in collecting this data, what did we have to do? We had to do a lot of mapping with open street maps. So we used open data to um, try to collect this and I use open data toolkit for this. So overall, our project focused on one, agriculture, and the second thing, how it affects climatic change and what we can do to improve it, especially in relation to women, because in Gambia, unlike in most parts of Africa, it's women that are highly involved in agriculture. And in this case, most of most of what they do, uh, most of what they grow, they use it to feed their families. So it's a, a subsistence farming. Um, within the Gambia in general, in carrying out this uh, project, this mapping project and working with the regions, the river Gambia um, flows from one end of the country to the other end of the country. So uh, it covered, um, so our project, apart from the um, greater Banjul area, which is um, includes Banjul and the capital, it covered all regions of the country to check how salt water had int um, um, intrusion has affected the River Gambia. So it, areas that used to have fresh water, you were not having them. So we used um, open, um, open street maps and we used drone technology to map the whole area and to collect this data. So th this just states the various villages visited in the different, Gambia is made up of six regions in Lower River region, Central River region, and the North Bank region, and Upper Region region, and West Coast region. Okay. So one of the challenges why this was done was, uh, one, most of these farmers do not have the capacity to go commercial. Mm, that's one of their challenges. And because of the salt water intrusion, most of these right farmers, they, they are only able to carry out rice farm production during the raining season, because during the rainy season, they're able to get fresh water that will water, um, will, um, will water the um, crops in, in, the, in the farm, in, in the farmlands. And again, even um, a lot of lack of integration has not happened. So you discovered that even um, the River Gambia water that they, they can usually use during the dry season, they're not able to irrigate it well. And of course, there's a very big um, problem on lack of um, land development in, in the regions that will that the government has not really done to support the agricultural sector. So these were some of the feedbacks we um, um, we found. Okay, it should also be discovered that because a lot of um, women play the role in this, like for everything we were doing we made sure we collected the data of the number of women that were working. I felt I should just give a breakdown of what was happening and how we used up the, the, the women that, um, that were working on the farms, the, the, the type of crops they were farming. If it's not rice, we were focusing on salt intrusion. They were also farming granules. Um, how many of them made use of technology in one way or the other, either uh, most of them use WhatsApp voice. They take pictures with WhatsApp to send messages about their crops and everything. And because with WhatsApp, they can record music. Um, how, how many times agricultural extension workers come to their, to visit them on their farms and what the data is available that um, in terms if they need um, fertilizers and, and everything. So that was what um, um, we did, you know. You know, we also checked about um, the uh, the data collected in, in um, based on the challenges, um, included machineries, included um, 
also problems with um, animal uh, intrusion, especially with the rice fields. We have a lot of hippopotamus and black monkeys, you know, because the, the, the rice fields are usually in the uh, in, in 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 the swampy uh, in um, swampy areas where salt up into, um, salt water has intruded, and the hippos they live in these uh, the hippopotamus they live in these swampy areas. So we we're trying to see how we can also use data, um, um, the open street maps and map the areas where the hippopotamus they usually go to, so that we can be able to inform the agricultural department very well. You know, over, overall, within the research, uh, we discovered that um, more needs to be done to help farmers, uh, more needs to be done in the areas of livelihood. And one of the things we discovered that for this to happen, we have to get more informed data and, and, and give it to the necessary authorities. And what we did with this is that we didn't just go, Joko Labs didn't just, my team didn't just go solo. Like So we ma made sure that at each step of our work we were doing, we we're working with the Ministry of Agriculture, the Department of Planning. So they were all involved in the process because at the end, end of the day, we feel our research and use of open data, we also help the government to make informed decision. So we have that basis. So the Ministry of Agriculture, they directed us where to go. Their, their field extension workers were on the ground and everything. Well, we discovered that um, it, um, there need to be more engagement in terms of climatic information, which we, we are going to try to look for the funding to develop a climatic um, information um, app that will be able to help farmers that will have voice recognition since, since most of them speak the local language so that they can be able to know when the weather changes and everything. Like our rain, traditionally the raining season at Gambia starts in June. Now, um, for the last, uh, over the last 10 years, it has usually started in, in July, you, 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 you know, so, and all this is affected by uh, climate change. We wanted to see also how, what we're going to do with salt intrusion, you know, uh, making use of data science, how are we going to help the agricultural department and also the um, the the, um, the Ministry of uh, Water Resources too, to see how we can manage the River Gambia to stop salt intrusion. It's, it's a work in progress, but these were all the data we were able um, to collect and these recommendations. There's a broader report, but since I knew we had um, short time for um, this presentation, that's just an overview of the work we are doing. And we hope to continue more to help our, our focus with this is more uh, as much as possible is to use open data tools and resources to be able to help the agrarian society in the Gambia that will help in the long run change government policies towards farming and best use of uh, open data tools. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Consulate. It was great to hear about your work and your project, and especially to understand a little bit more about the challenges and the recommendations that you have been able to make. We are going to move to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Carl Donard. He's a consultant, researcher, and education specialist, and he has been director of the European Center of Excellence, Digital Earth, based at Salzburg University, Austria, and director of Innovative Learning Network in UK. Carl was elected president of Eurogeo, the European Association of Geographers, since 2002, and he is a UK National Teaching Fellow, the highest award an academic can receive from their peers. He leads innovative projects, including the use of technologies in teaching, learning, and leading in education. Carl is an expert to the European Commission in Brussels and an elected member of Academia Europea. He researches and regularly publishes widely on many aspects of education, citizenship, the use of interactive media, and new technologies. He's going to present today uh, about open data for learning. So, Carl, the screen is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you. Could you uh, 
Uh, could you share the screen for me? I'm having some some small problems with doing it. Yes, of course. Just give me one minute. And, and just while that's going on, I'll mention my uh, I work for uh, a nonprofit organization called Eurogeo, European Association of Geographers. It's an academic and professional society based in Belgium. Uh, we try to um, promote geography, a geographical education, and in innovation in education. Um, and for the last uh, 15 years, we've been working with open data um, and try to encourage the use of geographic information, uh, geo-information, which is uh, our area um, for citizens' uh, uh, democratic engagement, but also for um, for education and teaching young people the value of, uh, of data, the value of open data and data skills. So my presentation will introduce uh, two projects, uh, which are the two logos there, D3 and Teaching the Future. We joined, uh, the next slide please, we joined the Open Data Charter in 2019. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, and, and these are some of our projects, so you can visit the web page to see the work we've been doing. SEED is a project, for example, which I'm not going to present here today, but it was a project to develop a new um, uh, uh, job description, if you like. The person who technically helps farmers choose the right uh, digital technologies to empower the farmers to become more efficient. In other words, it's drone technology, it's GIS, it's using uh, remote sensing and so on, as an example. Next slide, please. So we have a lot of projects we're working on. Um, as I said, we joined the Open Data Charter in 2009 when we started the, the D3 project I'm going to talk about. And if you just press again, please. And within the Open Data Charter, point 5D, states that it is key to engage with schools and post-secondary education institutions to support the increased open data research and to incorporate data literacy into educational curricula. And we saw this point and thought, well, this is precisely what we have been trying to do for the past 10 years. So we were very glad to join the Open Data Charter and we've been participating in the implementation group whenever we can. And the next slide, please. <clears throat> so the two projects I'm going to talk about are D3, the Developing Data, Digital Data Literacy, and the next slide, please. Let's be quite quick. And D3 had uh, four objectives. Um, D3 finished about five months ago. So all the products and all the activities I'm going to talk about are all available on the internet. Um, we aim to promote the use of digital technologies and open data tools in learning and teaching. In, in our review, very little was being done in schools. Um, uh, high schools was our focus group. We wanted to increase the capacity for democratic engagement. So the idea that you can identify and use data, and then you can, it's the same data that the policymakers have, and then you can use that data to make your voice heard. And that was our perspective, the fact that data should, is open for a reason, for transparency, and that young people especially ought to be able to make their voice heard based on the data that is there. But you can't do that unless you have data literacy. So our objective was to create a data literacy and to establish suitable styles of learning and then to try to um, improve educational stakeholders' response to the need for data. If we're going to live in a data rich society, we need to educate young people what is relevant for, for the data. And the next slide, please. <clears throat> so this relates to a European competence, European framework for digital competence. And in there, one of the competencies that's mentioned is the importance of digital tools, but also digital data. And the next slide, please. So we've created a literature review of school curricula and of qualifications and digital open data tools. You can find it on the website, d3.youthmeter.eu. We've created an open access teacher professional development course, really starting from the absolute basics. What is data and what data is being held about me? Uh, we've created a toolkit of useful teaching resources 
And finally, we have a gallery of case studies of teachers we've worked with who have taken the ideas from the professional development course and then implemented them in the schools that they're working in. And the next slide, please. So here are a couple of illustrations, the, 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 the toolkit and suggested tools, the homepage of the training course, and, uh, and a list of interesting and innovative tools and open data sets that schools and teachers might want to access. And the next slide, please. So on the left-hand side are the five modules of the training course, uh, digital citizen, uh, digital information, uh, communication with digital perspectives, problem solving. And on the right-hand side, we part of our teaching toolkit are 17 lesson blueprints, basic, very simple ideas about data and you, and you being the young people who are being taught. And it starts with where do you appear from your birth certificate and your date and your birth, all the way through to new technologies like Siri and artificial intelligence. So we have 17 lesson blueprint blueprints created by some innovative teachers that we've been working with. And the next slide, please. So that's D3. And that project finished about six months ago. And uh, for me, all the resources and materials have been generated by practicing teachers and supported, um, obviously, by the European Union Erasmus project. That moved us on to thinking about climate change. And we wanted to start to apply some of the things that we'd learned as part of D3 for climate change. Climate change, of course, is also one of the um, most important uh, uh, issues that the Open Data Charter is trying to deal with. So we've initiated a new project called Teaching the Future. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and it's about open data. And it's about the young people who went on the streets all around the world saying that we need to take climate action now. And Part of their campaign said, we need education, we need to understand and we need to know, um, and we need to be informed. Next slide, please. <clears throat> they say the earth is at this tipping point and it's urgent. And why aren't the policymakers doing anything about it? That was, that's been their campaign. It continues to be their campaign. And the next slide, please. <clears throat> So our premise is, can education with open data change perceptions of young people and their parents, probably, in terms of climate? Can an education with open data, integrating open data in teaching about climate change, um, be, benef be beneficial? And the next slide, please. And our results, the pro we're in the middle of the project at the moment, we've done an analysis of curriculum <clears throat> and looked at the potential with the schools we're working in for teaching the future. That's to say climate education and using open data. We, are, we have created, we are in the process of creating an online climate data dashboard, a teaching resource targeted at teachers with some materials, and it's been developed from expert analysis. So we have interviewed climate scientists. What data should we be giving to teachers in education? We've also interviewed education experts um, in universities, pedagogues and so on, trying to ask them, what should we do? And we will eventually create an online teacher training course in using scientific data about climate in the classroom. So we're halfway through the project. We've just ended year one of two years. And the next slide, please. <clears throat> so here are some of the results. Oh, yes. Here is the review. The review of the literature shows that the current way of teaching about climate change is not effective. As a uh, uh, it's taught as a geographic process. And that alternative visions of the future, according to Greer and Glackin, need to be presented. What are the visions of the future? Hence the project Teaching the Future. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So we started a review of what climate data is available online and what advice, support, and so on is there for education and teachers. Next slide, please. We found lots and lots and lots of data. Most of it is not feasible to actually look at. Most of it is very difficult to understand. So we have started to create our own climate data dashboards 
based on research that we've done with climate experts and also teacher trainers. And if you'd like to go and look at them and you go to teachingthefuture.eu news, we are at the moment piloting them with schools. We have about 12 schools across Europe who we're working with. Anyone can join, please. We'd like your advice. And these are the screen grabs of the climate data dashboards that we have created. You can zoom into your location and the data that is presented, either from 1961 to 1990 or 1971 to 2000, is representative of the area that is zoomed in. So each of these boxes, can, the, the maps can be zoomed in, and then the data in the blocks is based on the area that you zoom into. So we've taken global data sets that are widely available and open access and try to make them usable for teachers. And the next slide, please. And we've also looked at what is the future going to be like? And here we've taken the IPCC predictions for different data uses and the predictions, uh, sorry, this is a zoomed in picture of the first one. So you can see the data numbers change. Here's the Mediterranean. Um, and, and based on 61 to 1990, if you look at 1991 to 2020, the mean temperature inside the box is 17.3 for the last data group. And in 1961 to 1990, it was 16.6. .6. And the next slide, please. And this, the next slide is the screen gap of the prediction of what the future will be like. So data going from 2011 to 2040, or 2041 to 2070, and what will it be like in 2100? And we've taken three uh, scenarios, the green scenario with low emissions, the yellow scenario with moderate emissions, and the red scenario with high emissions. Each of these blocks is enlargeable. Next slide, please. And you can also download the data, so you can zoom in. So go to teachingthefuture.eu forward slash news, and you can have a look at these data sets that we're testing at the moment and piloting with schools. Um, we will be piloting them for about the next month. And then we will take the comments and we will revise our data dashboard. Uh, data dashboard. So we went from one data dashboard to two, and maybe we will add new data dashboards as we go along. Next slide, please. And these are the modules we're planning to develop for our training course. So it's about climate and open data. So four modules. Next slide, please. And to conclude, these are young people who were on strike. They want us to teach the future. They are frightened. They are scared about what climate is doing to the planet and their future. And the next slide, please. And so this was our incentive to try to do something about it and especially our perspective that young people need to be aware that scientists are working very hard to understand the future in other words it's about building scenarios it's about a future we want um, and how we reach it and that implies democratic engagement um, and i'll thank you very much and please visit our website teachingthefuture.eu and uh, I think we need to, to encourage more education projects that address open data to the young people so that they can in turn understand the value of all the great work that's being done by, uh, client, by scientists around the world um, who are trying to understand where we go so that we can make the right decisions for our own future. So I thank you very much. And I'll stop there. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Carl, for your presentation. It's great to hear the link you, you have done between open data and education and how it can be used to reach young people and to address uh, specific topics that are challenging nowadays, like climate change. So thank I you so add, much. I should add one more point. We're just trying yeah. to um, we're trying to create a new project to to take open data in, into universities uh, more, including into the departments where teachers are being trained. Because we feel that's the place it needs to be 
And so that's our big future initiative. Hopefully, maybe this time next year on Open Data Day, we'll have started our new initiative to take open data into, into higher education and, and into teacher education as well. Thank you. That sounds great. We look forward to hear how that advances. Thank you so much. Uh, we are going to our next speaker now. I'm going to switch to Spanish. Rem remember that you have the interpretation uh, button below. Uh, bueno, nuestro próximo speaker es Roberto Magro. Él es jefe de servicios interactivos del Ayuntamiento de Alcobendas, responsable de la web corporativa de transparencia, datos abiertos y accesibilidad de tecnologías de la información y la comunicación del Ayuntamiento. Es licenciado en Antropología Social y Cultural, máster en Alta Dirección Pública por la Universidad Internacional Menéndez y Pelayo, y participa en numerosas jornadas sobre transparencia y datos abiertos como formador y ponente. Es impulsor y coordinador del grupo de datos abiertos de la red de entidades locales por la transparencia y la participación ciudadana de la Federación Española de Municipios y Provincias. Y nos va a presentar hoy el trabajo que se hacen desde el grupo de trabajo de datos abiertos de la red de transparencia de la FEM. Muchas gracias, Roberto. Y bueno, es, la pantalla es tuya. Muchas gracias, Renato, y gracias primeramente a, a Open Data Charter por, por invitarnos a contar nuestra, nuestra experiencia. Y un placer eh, saludar a, a todos los que nos siguen y, y a los ponentes, ¿no? a los proyectos que están eh, presentando. Voy a, a compartir eh, la pantalla para que podáis ver la, la presentación. ¿De acuerdo? Eh, como bien has dicho, Renato, eh, yo coordino el grupo de datos abiertos de la red de entidades locales por la transparencia y la participación ciudadana de la, de, de la FEM. La Federación Española de Municipios y Provincias es una organización española en la que estamos todos los municipios que, y ciudades que existen en España, aproximadamente 8.500. Y dentro de la FEM hay diferentes redes de colaboración y que generan conocimiento y proyectos, y uno de ellos es el de... La, la red de entidades locales por la transparencia y la participación ciudadana. Esta red, concretamente, está formada por 269 socios, entre ayuntamientos, diputaciones y otras organizaciones españolas. Y el objetivo principal que tiene la red es eh, promover la innovación y la mejora permanente entre los gobiernos locales y la ciudadanía bajo los principios de, de gobierno abierto. El objetivo también es intercambiar experiencias, generar conocimiento y compartirlo con otros ayuntamientos para que lo puedan eh, utilizar. Y dentro de la red, como, como bien os decía, eh, existe el grupo de datos abiertos, un grupo multidisciplinar que está formado por gente de ayuntamientos, de empresas eh, públicas, de empresas privadas, de, del sector infomediario, de, de universidades. Aproximadamente somos entre 20 y 30 personas en el que lo que hacemos de forma desinteresada es eh, generar conocimiento y concretamente tenemos dos objetivos. La, la red empezó a funcionar allá por el año 2017 y a partir de ahí el grupo de datos abiertos fue el primero que se conformó y en el que empezamos a, a generar conocimiento y uno de, de ellos son las guías para ayuntamientos y otras administraciones públicas donde definimos cómo puede ser una estrategia de un proyecto de datos abiertos en una administración pública, en un ayuntamiento, por ejemplo, y qué conjuntos de datos podían empezar a abrir los ayuntamientos. ¿no? La idea es que crear, como ese segundo objetivo, eh, un modelo de referencia de conjuntos de datos, porque nuestra idea es que todos los ayuntamientos de España pudieran publicar los mismos conjuntos de datos y de la misma forma para que el sector infomediario y para los reutilizadores eh, pudieran tenerlo más fácil a la hora de eh, utilizar la información que se genera en el sector público. Estas son las tres guías que, que hemos publicado hasta el momento. La primera del año 2017, donde era una propuesta de cómo eh, implantar un proyecto de datos abiertos en una administración pública, en un ayuntamiento. Eh, la, Roberto, la de... no, se está no se está viendo la pantalla, ¿eh? si la quieres compartir nuevamente. ¿No se veía nada? No. Vale, pues perdonadme. Ahí está, ahí está bien. Vale, bueno, me habéis escuchado, entonces esa parte bien. Sí, sí, sí. Eh, estas tres guías, que son las que hemos publicado, 
Hasta la fecha se puede descargar gratuitamente en PDF eh, y en formato reutilizable desde la página web de la red. La primera del año 2017 era un texto narrativo en el que eh, invitábamos a los ayuntamientos a que si querían eh, implantar y poner en marcha un proyecto de, eh, de portal de datos abiertos, cómo deberían hacerlo, con qué tipo de recursos, con qué tipo de tecnología. En el año 2019 propusimos del grupo de trabajo... Eh, qué conjuntos eh, de datos, concretamente qué 40 conjuntos de datos mínimos debíamos eh, publicar en todas las administraciones locales, con ese objetivo que os planteaba al principio de, de facilitar la reutilización eh, por el sector intermediario, por las empresas privadas y también por la propia ciudadanía. Y el año pasado, en el año 2022, publicamos la guía de visualización de datos. Fue una colaboración con un ayuntamiento español de Hospitales de Llobregat, donde eh, indicamos qué tipo de visualizaciones serían las adecuadas para complementar lo que son la, los conjuntos de datos que, que nos podemos descargar desde los portales de datos abiertos. Entonces, es una información muy útil porque creemos que la mayoría de la población no entiende qué es esto de los datos abiertos y lo que hace las visualizaciones es facilitar la, la comprensión de, de la información re reutilizable, ¿no? Y dos proyectos concretamente en los que estamos inmersos en este año 2023. El primero es la revisión de la guía del año 2019 y, y vamos a proponer 80 conjuntos de datos eh, para publicar. Está previsto que el próximo mes de abril publiquemos esa, esa información y ahora os daré un, un adelanto. Y el otro proyecto que creemos que va a ser también muy interesante es proponer desde el grupo una ordenanza tipo, es decir, una normativa tipo sobre el gobierno del, del dato, para que cualquier ayuntamiento y cualquier administración pública en España la pueda tomar como ejemplo, como plantilla, por si luego quiere crear o quiere aprobar dicha normativa en el ámbito local en cada ayuntamiento. ¿no? Eh, como os decía al principio, eh, es importante recalcar que el trabajo es desinteresado, es decir, que todos trabajamos de forma desinteresada y gratuita para elaborar esta, estos documentos y lo que hacemos es, de forma colaborativa, tener varias reuniones presencialmente eh, una, o dos, una o dos al año y luego el resto del trabajo es de forma colaborativa a través de, de redes y, de, y de, de herramientas tipo como Zoom, Teams, eh, etc. El proyecto de los 80 conjuntos de datos a, a publicar. Es una propuesta de conjunto de, de datos que desde las administraciones públicas podríamos publicar. Eh, están clasificados ya con los eh, determinados conjuntos de datos, si son de alto valor, según se define en la estrategia y en la directiva europea. También eh, buscamos y, y lo que hacemos es definir en cada uno de los conjuntos de datos e indicar si se cumplirían algunos de los eh, objetivos de desarrollo sostenible. Y luego todo lo que estamos generando eh, nos coordinamos con, eh, con datos.gov.es, que es el portal estatal, el portal de España de datos abiertos y la oficina del dato que hay en España. ¿no? De forma colaborativa compartimos la información eh, para que ellos, si lo ven oportuno, difundan y divulguen lo que estamos haciendo o incluso estemos alineados luego con la estrategia, con la estrategia europea. Voy a seguir compartiendo, en este caso... Eh, el modelo de ficha de cada uno de los conjuntos de datos para que veáis eh, el trabajo que estamos, a, que estamos haciendo eh, en, al, al respecto y bueno pues eh, esta es una hoja, eh, es un borrador donde se ven los nombres de los conjuntos de datos hasta 80 que nosotros eh, vamos a, a proponer, a sugerir su traducción al inglés y quiero enseñaros también, por ejemplo eh, un modelo de ficha ya relleno, creo que se ve bien, ¿verdad, Renato? En el que, en este caso, la propuesta es el de... Sí, se ve bien. El de accidentes de tráfico, donde definimos o describimos cómo debería ser el conjunto de datos, si, eh, según la clasificación española de, 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 nacional de, de interoperabilidad y, y luego también, como veis, si es una categoría de eh, conjunto de datos de alto valor que define Europa o es una que hemos creado nosotros desde los ayuntamientos porque creemos que es adecuada. Con, un, con documentos de referencia, si existe en vocabulario, lo pondríamos también y, bueno, pues una propuesta de cómo debería de actualizarse cada uno de esos conjuntos de datos. En este caso, consideramos que los accidentes de tráfico, si los pudiéramos publicar 
en, en un ayuntamiento pues debería estar actualizado diariamente, los principales formatos de ese conjunto de datos eh, y bueno, podéis ver aquí incluso algunos ejemplos que se ponen de algunos conjuntos de datos de algunas administraciones y ayuntamientos que ya lo publican o incluso, como veis aquí al final, qué tipo de objetivos de desarrollo sostenible, las metas o indicadores se cumplirían si somos capaces de publicar ese conjunto de datos. Os he puesto un ejemplo, pero hay muchos, ¿no? Este, por ejemplo, es eh, de aparcamiento público, eh, arbolado, eh, etc. Toda esta información es la que vamos a difundir y vamos a publicar el próximo mes de abril para que todo el mundo pueda conocer la propuesta que hacemos desde los ayuntamientos españoles para que cualquiera lo pueda, lo pueda reutilizar y os pueda a servir, servir, por ejemplo, eh, a, vo, a vosotros. ¿no? Y otro de los proyectos que, que quería recalcar es la ordenanza tipa, eh, tipo de, de gobierno del dato. ¿no? Eh, creemos que, que en determinados ayuntamientos va a ser necesario un instrumento normativo que ofrezca la seguridad y la perdurabilidad eh, del gran cambio cultural que yo creo que vamos a, a, a tener las administraciones públicas en los, en los próximos años, sobre todo porque creemos que si abordamos eh, el gobierno del dato, las administraciones, mejoraremos notablemente la gestión ¿no? y la eficacia y eficiencia de, de lo público. ¿no? Y en ese sentido, eh, es una propuesta, es un texto normativo para que pueda aprobarse aquellos ayuntamientos que quieran o puedan, el, eh, lo puedan aprobar y lo que sobre todo mejore cómo gobernan los datos que tiene todo un ayuntamiento eh, de forma horizontal y cómo muchos de ellos mejorarán no solo el trabajo interno, sino que incluso repercutirá directamente en la ciudadanía, en la ciudad o incluso en mejorar la, la gestión eh, municipal. Aquí veis un borrador de los apartados que, que va a tener esa ordenanza, que ya se está redactando, pues un marco general... Eh, bueno, pues eh, una información general. Esto es, esto es el, eh, el esquema básico de, de un texto normativo y reglado eh, que puede existir, eh, que existe aquí en, en España. ¿no? Eh, Veis el apartado 3 de todo lo que tiene que ver con la administración, el municipio o la diputación, bueno, la planificación política, los diferentes apartados. También a la ciudadanía y otras administraciones públicas que, que se verán afectados por, por esta normativa, si la llegasen a, a, a aprobar los, los ayuntamientos. Y por mi parte, nada más. Eh, si necesitáis eh, alguna aclaración o alguna pregunta, será un placer luego al final poder compartir y contestar a cualquier duda o pregunta que surja por parte de los oyentes. Y ahí tenéis tanto mi contacto como la página web de la Red de Transparencia y Participación Ciudadana, donde está toda la información, no solamente del grupo de datos abiertos, sino de otros grupos de trabajo que existen en la red y que os pueden eh, interesar. Por mi parte, nada más. Muchísimas gracias. Buenísimo. Muchísimas gracias, Roberto. Eh, Súper interesante escuchar eh, un trabajo articulado que se puede hacer desde distintos lugares, desde los gobiernos locales y con propuestas concretas también de, de ordenanzas y de cómo, cómo mejorar, digamos, todo lo que es la gobernanza y de datos abiertos y poder, poder trabajar y superar las barreras. Gracias por la presentación. Eh, voy a cambiar a inglés una vez más. I'm going to switch to English again for our last speaker. Uh, our last speaker today is Charlie Marshall. He, he is a project manager for government and it means in Africa. Charlie is the president of Afro Leadership, a pan African civil society organization specializing in civic technologies, open data, and data governance in Africa. He is the Africa representative of PLACE, a geospatial data trust a governing board member of the International Aid Transparency Initiative, IATI, the Open Budget Survey Researcher for Cameroon and Central Africa Republic, and a founding member of My, da My Data Global, a founding member and board of directors member of A New Governance, global organizations promoting fair data economy, data sharing, and data space. He is going to present Uh, he, the name of his presentation is Promoting Open Data and Open Governance Through Various Routes. So, Charlie, thank you for being here, and the screen is yours. Thank you. Uh, merci, Renato. Uh, I know there is no translation from French, so <laughs> I'm going in English. So, thank you, and thank you also for 
all the presentation we've got. Uh, if you allow me, I will share my uh, I will share my screen. Right here. Yeah. And I hope you you get it. Yes, we can see it perfectly. Thank okay, you. thank you. So it is actually talking of uh, uh, how we try to promote open data through various means because uh, contrary to what uh, Roberto and Carl and uh, Poncelet showed us, uh, we see that we are in various jurisdictions and we see clearly that we have so many differences in uh, in, in, in the way we look at open data and the way we leave open data in our countries. And so um, I've just tried to get uh, information about what we have been doing to try to, to move this and uh, and and following up our leadership, our missions that are for leadership uh, as to, to empower citizens and so that as citizens might claim their rights for an informed participation in public governance, uh, the true goal of open data, as we say it. And you will see that we we have been working on this uh, on this on several projects, trying to make sure we could we could find champions and leaders at every levels of government and governance in our countries. And I'm, I will say in our countries because our leadership uh, uh, has been working in various countries in Francophone Africa mainly, uh, meaning uh, Gabon, Congo, Cameroon, where we where we are headquartered and, uh, and some other countries like the Comoros trying to open uh, uh, the way public governance is led. And then, uh, in Cameroon, this is the presentation of uh, our last project that has to do with uh, 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 open participatory budgeting, trying to open budget budget data. Because as you as you might know, in uh, our countries, we don't most of our countries don't have you know a comprehensive strategy or policy to push uh, open data. So most of the time, you will have in the regulatory framework that you have few articles here and there talking of uh, access to information or, or or open data itself and so given the fact that you don't have this sort of you know a leadership being led on top from top of government we have been trying all this why to to look at ways where we could push for some of those projects and one of the the key one we found is that we have more opportunities in our uh, laws and in our regulations when it comes to public finance management. And we, we have tackled that one and trying to push for open, uh, open budgeting at local level. And uh, this last project has to do with that one in the far North Cameroon with funding from uh, US Embassy and trying to, to use this to push also for the open data charter too and the principles that you just align when we started this uh, this meeting, and then this is a, a, a slide showing you know how people idea and how governments, uh, local governments idea to this project. And so far, we've got 25, 25 local governments in Cameroon who have, who have accepted to sign MOU on pushing pushing them to publish. Uh, to publish their budget data, at least budget data, and and you might understand that we we use just this key, this key door, you know, to get into uh, uh, open data in our local governments, and and then we have also started working with government in Africa, and this covers the continent, and this will certainly be uh, something that Carl that Carl understands well because Place is a, it's a, a global organization that we founded. Uh, that was in Omedia Network working on property rights. And now uh, with Place, we have decided to work on how to open geodata in every country and mostly in developing country, how to, to set a, a kind of level playing field where uh, data collection, that is the key constraints and key impediment to access geodata can be leveraged. And, and that's what Place is doing, trying to collect data, to use a model that will collect data and geodata in hyper-local way from in countries and then releasing the data to government 
bringing back the sovereignty on geo data to government and also uh, signing contracts with government to put the data in a data trust that will be available to anyone, to school, to students, to researchers, and to any uh, public administrations, you know, that will probably do the work that Carl just just presented of the work that uh, uh, Ponselet, Ponselet just presented there. So one of the key problems that we have in our context is that data is not even available, you know. So even to speak open data, we need first to have data. And then when it comes to geodata, especially, we are very far from, from having data that is updated and that is reliable enough even to be to be seriously useful for public policies. And then we have been also designing open data action labs. This is a collaboration between Afro leadership and the Gov Lab. The Gov Lab is uh, one of the great research uh, lab on open data based in the US. And then we just set up this because we were part of uh, uh, open data relation report in Africa uh, several years back. And so for, for three, four years now, we have done released the report. And then we look at uh, this situation with, with the Gov Lab and we thought it would be probably good to, to set up a kind of working group or maybe to build a dynamic that will help you know, to get back to this policy strategy that was built and to see if we, if we have to enhance existing policy or if we have to, to, to build new policies, you know, just to make sure we can, we can push the dynamic around open data or around data collaboration and data reuse, something that we need seriously in Africa and that will certainly help countries where open data policy are not really available, you know, to, to just, you know, get inspired by those policies that we might have uh, uh, on the continent. And we see that African Union has just released last year, February 2022, you know, the open the data policy framework. And we would like to build on that and build also on the African data consensus and also the uh, uh, open, open the statistic, um, uh, African data statistic um, uh, framework, you know, just to try to, to build dynamic that countries will get you know, to in, to get inspired and to build their own local policy, and that will go back, go probably down to our municipalities. And then we have also tried to to bring open data, you know, in the in the in the sense of official aid assistance, and that's that's um, another sector where we have key problems. And so far uh, uh, on IATI, the International a transparency initiative and we we have been trying to call countries especially in developing countries in africa you know to to join iati and to make sure we can open at transparency uh, at data in a transparent and participatory way to 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 improve accountability around on the use of official ed assistance and uh, and so we were or not to be part of uh, we are actually honored to be part of the governing board. And I'm very happy that Cameroon is, has just called to join IATI and that will certainly give us to, to open more data and maybe to revamp the, the uh, official ed database that Cameroon builds a few years back. And we are also encouraging so many African countries to join IATI where we could uh, bring more open data on official uh, assistant ed, and that will also help civil society organization to tap into the data and to and to improve their capacity, their data literacy, and their advocacy work on this aspect. And also, we we've been trying to to push our our civil society organizations here to get to know. Uh, uh, the terms of license that work in the realm of open data by joining Creative Commons as a pro leadership and also trying to encourage uh, uh, opening chapters in, in some countries, especially in Central Africa. And those are kind of things we do just to make sure data literacy can go hand on hand with, uh, with this type of knowledge that have to do with the type of license that governments, municipalities, and also uh, data communities might use when releasing data or when using data. And then this is uh, an opportunity that we had with the prime minister in Cameroon 
where we presented uh, open contracting data standard just to push Ministry of uh, Public Contract and the uh, uh, um, public administration doing regulation in public contract to try to set this, this meeting that will show them what are the opportunities and also the benefits that we could have in all the system that is being uh, digitalizing the in Cameroon if all the public contracting system could embed or um, by default, you know, open contracting data standard terms. So here it's at the prime minister uh, services with the national program on governance that has been a partner with uh, a pro leadership on this. And also, I think when we started our meeting today, Renato talked of uh, digital rights. That is part of uh, of our open data charter dynamic. And we have been working also with My Data Global trying to, to build this and to build a community. In Cameroon, we build a community and we are trying to set up many communities in, 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 in Africa as we are actually managing the My Data, My Data Africa to show what are the stakes when we talk of open data, but also when to, to see the link between open data and digital right and personal and personal data and the conditions that should be that should be met if we want really to open data while protecting uh, protecting human 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 rights and uh, and also uh, through this we talk of data justice and we even have this a specific meeting today with Mozilla and trying to to show that as artificial intelligence is uh, is getting you know it, there is a hype <laughs> for artificial intelligence and that is very much justified we would like to make sure uh, why we use data you know to train our models and to build in artificial intelligence tools we need to care about data justice and to make sure you know those who are vulnerable and those who are not those who are not on the table when it comes to data and digital digital space are really really taken into account when we design our systems and and even today we did a report on that with the collaboration of Alan Turing in in um, in Britain and Samia in Montreal trying to show what are the what are the key constraints for data justice right now in sub-Saharan Africa and we will be talking of talking of that in in few hours now and also, uh, we, we believe that if we want to talk open data, artificial intelligence, and all those stuff, we also need to make sure people are really, really involved. And today, when we talk of the digital work, there are so many people that are excluded by the fact that just internet access or internet connection is not available. And so we, we presented a regulatory framework that we could use to make sure internet community network will be built in context where we know that those who are uh, uh, telcos might not be very happy to, or maybe very encouraged to go there because of uh, business reasons. And we think that there are solutions, very cost efficient solution that will have to include more people, especially in rural areas in Africa. And, uh, and then, uh, Is it uh, is it blocked this? Renato, do you follow me? Okay, so now it got uh, changed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, it was not changing. <laughs> so one of the things that we saw while talking open data to local municipalities is that so many of them don't don't even have a website. So we did this in Cameroon. We have about five hundred uh, municipalities, and we see clearly that we have about three hundred municipalities that doesn't that don't have a website so in this case you see we go from very far when we talk of open data you know trying to put data on on digital platforms that will be that would provide UDP, ubiquitous access to to people and so this is just to show the constraints that we have and also we we try also to to encourage our local municipalities to adopt you know a, a, a civic tech participatory platform that will help, you know, disseminate more information and also encourage more deliberation, you know, between them and, uh, and local population. And this is, uh, this was a, a, um, the meeting with the CDM Association in Barcelona last year, you know, try to, 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 to brainstorm uh, uh, around how we could, how we could make participatory platform more, more uh, usable you know just to make sure we can we don't we don't keep it very technically complex 
and this was just to reflect on that. And so uh, I would like to end this by saying we are calling all countries to open budgets because we, we have understood that this is a key, key type of data set where we have more incentives when we look at the regulatory framework. Some of that data sets is more difficult to open now, right now in Africa, in most countries. And so thank you for that. That's great. Thank you so much, Charlie. It's great to learn how you work with different partnerships uh, in such different topics uh, through Africa. It's really great. Uh, now we have a few minutes left. Uh, this can be an open space if we have someone from the audience that wants to make uh, some question or some comment. This is the moment. If there's someone there who wants to raise your hand and speak. And if not, I have uh, one last question to, to our speakers to, to close the session. I'm going to make my question and if someone wants to speak from the audience, please just raise your hand and, and I'll give you a space. Uh, the, the last question, you have mentioned some of these things, but if you can, I would like to know if from your experience, from the work that you have done in, in, in your projects or in your region, uh, what are, if you can tell us one or two important lessons that you came across from, from the work you're doing. Uh, maybe we can start with Charlie. Charlie, if you wanna, if you wanna, if you wanna share with us, like just maybe one or two important lessons or challenges that you have come across in your projects or in your region, working in your region. Yeah, I think. Uh, thank you, thank you, Renato. I think uh, the first thing to say is that um, a regulatory framework is not harmonious and it's very mm. fragmented, and so. Uh, Without a regulatory framework, it's very difficult to, uh, you know, to work on the on the on the open data specifically. Because even yeah. when you have a, a very serious regulatory framework, then you move yeah. on to uh, culture constraints, you move on to technical constraints, you move on to institutional constraints, and all those, all those are just uh, you know. Working on those constraints without a very clear regulatory framework that would give, you know, the clear direction and align everyone with the key policies that goes from this uh, uh, regulatory framework is very difficult. So for me, that's the the key problems that we have. And then we can go now down to you know data literacy and all those stuff. But but first, this is one big framework. big challenge. Big big yeah. challenge, serious challenge. So, so that's for me. Thanks. That's great. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, Poncelet, if you want to share your thoughts on one or two main lessons that you came across in your work. I think um, for me is uh, making sure that government understand the use of open data, how it's important for development. It's very key that this is achievable and uh, that is one key lesson and it's also very important to also engage our governments because most of them are really not involved our public servants in the use of open data for social economic development whether it's in the agricultural sector health sector education sector so advocating for that and doing more on that is something that um, we definitely want to do and we cannot do it in isolation we have to do it with partners we have to continue being involved to learn best practices from organizations that we are part of and partnering with like the open data chatter so that is one lesson i think i will share thank you thank you so much for sharing that with us i'm going to switch to spanish for the last question eh, bueno, Roberto, te pregunto a ti también, desde la experiencia trabajando en gobiernos locales y trabajando con la red de, de participación y transparencia de la FEM, 
cuál te parecen uno, una o dos lecciones o desafíos con los que te hayas encontrado eh, en este camino de trabajo? Bueno, yo por un lado quiero poner en, en valor, el, el, como lo decía en mi presentación, el trabajo desinteresado que ha hecho posible que el grupo eh, se pusiera en marcha y haya sido capaz de generar propuestas, guías eh, e incluso eh, ahora eh, la, la, ordenanza, la ordenanza tipo. Es decir, que un grupo de personas eh, que, que mayoritariamente trabajan en el sector público y que hayan querido eh, fuera de su tiempo de trabajo generar esos conocimientos para compartirlo, yo creo que es que es muy importante, ¿no? Es, es trabajo desinteresado. Eh, estoy de acuerdo con algunos de los eh, ponentes, ¿no? Y, y no estamos tan, tan distantes eh, en, en, en cómo lo estamos viviendo desde las administraciones locales. Eh, yo creo que en España estamos ahora en un, en un proceso muy importante, de aquí al año 2030, sobre todo, en el que se están transformando las organizaciones, se están digitalizando o se espera que estén digitalizadas la mayoría de las administraciones públicas al 100%, y yo creo que ahí va a ser claro, clave perdón, que exista eh, una estrategia de gobierno del dato, porque los datos van a hacer que nos permitan cambiar más rápidamente y transformar esa administración analógica en esa transforma, eh, transformación digital. Los que tienen más recursos, las ciudades y los municipios que tienen más recursos, eh, eh, lo tendrán algo más fácil, pero no debemos dejar atrás a los pequeños municipios eh, de la mano de las provincias y de las diputaciones, que son los que eh, tirarán y empujarán para que también los pequeños municipios puedan estar a la altura de ayuntamientos tan grandes pues como el de Alcobendas, Madrid o, o, o Barcelona. ¿no? Entonces, yo creo que son dos retos eh, interesantes. El trabajo colaborativo desinteresado en creer en el tema de los datos y dos, el... Eh, el que el gobierno del dato va a ser clave para mejorar y para ayudar a esa transformación de lo analógico a lo digital en las administraciones públicas. Genial. Muchísimas gracias, Roberto. Ahí nos preguntan en el chat eh, si se puede compartir el link a las guías por, a través del chat. Sí, sí. Ahora mismo os voy a poner directamente el vínculo que estaba en la presentación y donde podéis descargaros las tres, las tres guías y donde próximamente publicaremos también la información de... De, de la propuesta de los 80 conjuntos de datos. Lo voy a poner Buenísimo. Ahora. Genial. Ahí queda en el chat eso entonces. Muchas gracias. Eh, well, we are almost running out of time. I would like to, to share a few messages before we close. Here in the chat is our email. Uh, we are having the, in the next two weeks two other sessions in different regions. And also we meet every month in our implementation working group, uh, exchanging experiences with our partners and our adopters and endorsers. So you are free to join. You are, you are invited to join uh, our meetings. If you need any additional information, you can reach us and in that email. And also, I would like to share with you this link that it's a public calendar that we make with our events at with the events of our network. So you can you can find what out what's happening there in in the link. And I think that that's all from my side today. I like to. Thank you so much uh, for, for being here, especially to our speakers that share so many different projects on linking open data to the work in local governments, in education, in agriculture, in public procurement, in citizen participation. It has been, a, we have a really diverse uh, view of projects. Um, I think that's all from my side. Thank you so much and hoping to to see you again soon in another meeting and see how these projects uh, go on. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye. bye.